Today I'm going to talk about the Jamison cell, the love of my life, and talk to you about the importance of bubbles. So I, I realise most of you people probably know this, but I wasn't sure of the audience, so I thought I'd just uh, really quickly cover the, the value chain in, in copper mining, and in this case, well, I've covered copper here, so we go from the mines, so they can be open cut or underground, we then feed the concentrator to actually make a product that we can smelt, refine, and then we end up with an end product for, for sale. An alternative is to, um, to mine generally by open cut and leach, which is a, a lower cost way of producing copper through refining. And the reason I wanted to show you the value chain was to show you where our technology is sitting in the value chain. So we don't have anything in the mining field, but we have uh, the Isomil and the Janison cell that sit in the concentrating and leaching areas. Obviously the Isa smelt and smelting and Isa kit in refining. And if you then look at just Glencore Copper Australia, um, these are the technologies we have within Glencore Copper Australia. We have Jamison cells at Mount Isa and at Cobar. We have Isa mills at Ernest Henry. And we <coughs> smelt using Isa smelt at Mount Isa. And obviously Isa kit at the Townsville Copper Refinery. So that's just to give you an overview of where our technologies fit into the copper uh, value chain. Once again, just to get back to really basics, when we're talking about concentrators now, um, Essentially, we're receiving ore from the mine. It tends to be up to 10 inches in size. That's big stuff. And the job of the concentrator is to make that, that into very small stuff and do a separation between the valuable and the non-valuable. So it does that through stages of grinding, flotation, and then it produces products. It produces tailings for disposal and concentrate, which is then dewatered and sent to the smelter. So the Jamison cell fits into the flotation stage to improve the quality of the concentrates sent to smelting. So in terms of grinding, grinding basics, we're grinding big rocks to make them into little rocks. And in the process of making big rocks little, we're wanting to liberate the valuable mineral. So in this case, the valuable mineral is shown as black. And so we're wanting to make particles that are smaller and end up with high liberation. So lots of simple black particles. This is uh, actually Mount Isa data, which shows particles in the feed that are composites between the yellow being chalcopyrite and the gray being quartz. And after liberation, you have much more free yellow particles and only some that remain in composites. The Isa mill technology would then be used to further grind this down to make more liberated yellow particles. The flotation process itself simply exploits the difference in the surface wettability of these particles once we've ground them up. So a hydrophobic particle, just like it sounds, it absolutely hates water. So when these particles actually strike a bubble, they don't like the water phase, so they say, love you bubble, I'll stay with you. So they become attached. Hydrophilic particles, such as the, the quartz, um, they're not fussed. They're not fussed by air. They're happy to stay in the water phase. So when they come in contact with a bubble, they've got no reason to attach. So they just remain in the wetted phase. So I've just got some, some photos here that are probably a bit hard to see, but you, you can see on this particular surface that those water bubbles are being repelled. They're sitting there uh, um, all curled up. So the surface is trying to repel that water. So obviously it hates it. And this one you can see it's a, a bit of repulsion but essentially the water is spreading out. So you can see on various surfaces whether they're hydrophobic or hydrophilic. And you'll see that at home sometimes you, you know, in a puddle of water you'll see things that sit on the surface and you'll see other times that you know, there'll be no difference, everything just, just floats within the water phase. So some particles or some minerals have natural hydrophobicity whereas others we have to impart the hydrophobicity on the particles. So in this case um, we're showing uh, what we call collector molecules and these collector molecules are a chemical that we add to the, to the slurry and they're attracted to the valuable mineral. So they sit on the surface of the valuable mineral and they, this end of the molecule hates water. So that, that makes the whole particle hydrophobic and more readily attachable to air bubbles. 
So once we have hydrophobic and hydrophilic particles, now we actually have to bring them in contact with, with these, uh, uh, these bubbles. So now we're talking about collision. So we need to collide particles and bubbles and get an attachment to achieve flotation. So in some cases, you get attachment, the, the particle and the bubble collide and all's good, Bob's your uncle. And in some cases, the particle it will collide but not attach. And in some cases, the particle will never even collide. So this is a pretty neat photo just showing some actual air bubbles carrying minerals. And you can see um, all the minerals tend to slide around the bottom and hang off, hang off the bottom uh, because you've got a, a bubble rising in a phase. And what then happens is sometimes they get a bit heavy and they actually drop off. So coarse particles are more likely to drop off. Fine particles, when they're attached, are more likely to be recovered to the froth phase. So in some cases, you have unsuccessful attachments. So you imagine a bubble rising up through, through water. There's a, there's a streamline of water going around it, just like a streamline around a car or an aeroplane. And in some cases, the, the, the particles are big enough that they're going to come in contact anyway. So they're going to hit the bubble and they're going to attach. But in the case of very small particles, chances are they're just going to wander by in the slipstream. So they're not even going to see, see the, um, the bubble, which means getting a fine particle onto a bubble is much more difficult than getting a coarse particle on a bubble. So the Janison cell uh, was developed at Mount Isa Mines. Uh, in the mid-80s, um, MIM commissioned Professor Graham Jamison uh, from the University of Newcastle to look at a project to improve the operation of the flotation columns that had been installed there in the early <coughs> 80s. The flotation columns are very big and it, it was found that the, the operating and maintenance uh, challenges associated with those columns were mainly around the fact that the, the equipment that produced bubbles used to deteriorate. So the bubbles would just get bigger and bigger and the efficiency of the columns would drop off. So Graham said it seemed really inefficient to need such a huge volume in a column to, uh, to, to do this job. There must be a much more efficient way of bringing bubbles and particles together. And so that was the focus of his work. So the first Jamison cell tests were, were, were done in the late 80s. <clears throat> and these are the first two cells that were installed in the lead zinc concentrator at that time. And this was the result of that, that work between Mount Isa Mines and, and Graham Jamison. And he developed the concept of the downcomer. And in the downcomer, fine bubbles are generated and they can't help but collide with uh, particles. So the particles and the bubbles are brought together forcibly and, uh, and that means that the process is very fast and doesn't require the large volumes of a column. So you'll see in this example, these are three columns that were installed in the lead zinc concentrator in, in the early 80s. They're very large. And these are two Jamison cells of equivalent volume. So these do the same flotation work as these do. So you can see there's a huge savings in terms of real estate in the Jamison cell because it's so much more efficient. So we'll show you what's happening in the down camera. Most of you have probably seen this before. But essentially the, the slurry is accelerated through a nozzle and is, is jetted into an area that's got a high amount of, of air that's been drawn in. In this case, it's now got coal in it. You can see it's jetting and colliding very vigorously in this area where there's a combination of coal particles and air that's been drawn in. So it's a very violent reaction. So why is the Jamison cell so successful at getting attachments of bubbles and particles? Well, it's really, it's all about the bubbles absolutely all about the bubbles. So if you look at a, a fixed volume of air, and in this case we're talking about a one cubic millimetre of air, in a conventional cell, one cubic millimetre of air, if you have a bubble diameter of one millimetre, will only give you that many bubbles. But because the Jamison cell makes much smaller bubbles, down to 300 mic micron or 0.3 millimetre, you can see the same volume of air gives you way more bubbles. So if you've got way more bubbles, then you've got a far better chance of actually getting bubble particle contacts, attachment, and therefore recovery. <coughs> so this is just some industrial measurements that were done by McGill University around the world, showing 
bubble size measurements in industrial settings. So these green lines represent columns. So they have a bubble size of about two and a half millimetre. Uh, and on this axis, it's simply how much air you're adding. So as you add more air, the bubbles actually get bigger. <coughs> these are conventional uh, tank and U-shaped cells. So generally they get between one and one and a half millimetre bubbles. And once again, as you add air, the bubbles get bigger. The Jamison cell is in a world of its own. It's way smaller bubbles still gets the same impact of, of increasing size with, with, with air rate, but it's way smaller. So the, the machine makes the bubbles. So the Jamison cell makes better bubbles than other machines. However, to retain the small bubbles, we actually have to add chemicals. Because if we didn't add the chemicals, what would happen is the bubbles would just coalesce. They'd just join together. So this is just an example of, of if you were just Adding air in water, you get big bubbles because you've, you've got no reason for them not to join together into, uh, uh, into bigger bubbles. But if you add what we call a frother, and in this case MIBC, you'll see that the bubbles can retain their small size. So it's critical, not only do you need to make good bubbles, make small bubbles, you've got to keep them small. Because if you let them grow, they're going to become less efficient. So this is just another example to show you how you can add that chemical and your bubble size just keeps getting smaller. Down to a point where essentially, no matter how much more chemical you add, it doesn't get any smaller. But this is really critical in cold flotation where they're really constrained by the amount of frother they're able to add, but it's so important because without adding the frother, you can't make the small bubbles and you can't get the recoveries. So let's just summarize what we've uh, what we learned about the Jamison cell and how it operates. We're going to be pumping slurry down through a nozzle. Okay, and uh, those of you who haven't seen it, this is a slurry lens. This is the type we use in, in industry. This is the size we use. So the slurry is pumped through the nozzle and you create a pressure drop as you change the, the size. As it fills up the tank, you create a seal across the bottom of your downcomer. So now your downcomer is submerged in slurry, and at that point, you generate a vacuum. And air is now sucked in, so you suck air in. This jet then plunges into a bed of air, and it breaks that air up into tiny little bubbles. So what's happening, you saw in the video, was you get this violent mixing happening at this point in the, in the downcomer. And this is where all your flotation's happening. You, you're generating your bubbles and you're contacting them violently with all your particles. So all of the slurry passes through a downcomer. So all of the slurry and all of the particles have an opportunity to attach to a bubble. In conventional flotation, it's often tanks and you feed the slurry into a tank, you have a mixer and you generate bubbles at the bottom. So not every bit of that slurry has an opportunity to see a bubble. Whereas in the Jamison cell, every, everything goes through here. Everything has a chance to, to see the bubbles. So all of the flotation happens here. It's very quick. So the residence time in that downcome is only a matter of, of seconds. And therefore, the flotation area you need is much smaller. You just need enough downcomers to treat all the volumetric flow. That's where your flotation is happening. Um, and then the, the rest of it is simply doing a separation between your froth-laden bubbles and your tailings. So do the flotation in your downcomer, the rest of the tank is just about doing a separation between the good stuff and the tailings. So the most critical operating parameter for a Jamison cell, therefore, is constant flow through this jet. Because if you don't have constant flow there, then the level here is gonna be going up and down, the amount of air being drawn in is gonna change. So it's very important that that flow rate is a constant. And that's why in our design phases, we've designed into the process constant flow. So let's, let's look at the actual cell components. Uh, this actually is an old uh, top fed, but this, the distributor can be either fed from the top or from the bottom. This is a two-part distributor. The top half deals with slurry. The bottom half deals with the air. So the slurry comes into the distributor and is distributed down the individual downcomers through an isolation valve for 
for maintenance, we can shut down that valve and, and then isolate this down from it to look at it. Comes through the flexible feed nozzle, through the slurry lens, into the down proper, where the flotation is occurring. The mineral laden bubbles will then rise up through the diffuser, which spreads the bubbles across the surface area of the cell. Otherwise, they'd have a tendency to just race up the side of the downcomer, so the diffuser spreads it out over the area of the cell into our froth layer, which can be washed with wash water. At the same time, our air and the bottom half of our distributor is being drawn in through our ACE valve, which is protecting the air from slurry being drawn back up, and the air is coming in and mixing. The concentrate is recovered down the concentrate launder and the tailings simply flows down through the tailings launder. There are no moving parts in this. So that's one of the best features of the Jamison cell is it's stationary. The only moving part we have in the whole system is the pump. And concentrators deal with pumps all the time. So maintaining a pump's no big deal. But when you compare this, for example, with an isomill, essentially the isomill is having to grind rocks down smaller, so nearly everything's moving. Once you're moving, you're wearing it out. This has very low wear because nothing's moving. This is just a closer look uh, to show in the airline. We can, we can measure the flow and we can control the flow, so we can control the amount of air that we draw into the cell. And that would then actually control the level in this down cover. If we add lots and lots and lots of air, the level goes down, so all the flotation's happening down here. If you don't add much, the level's way up here if the flotation's happening up here. So the air is, the amount of air you add is really just how much do you want to recover. Think of it, the more mass you want to recover off a cell, then the more air bubbles you have to put in to recover that mass. So when we look about why the Jamison cell does a reasonable job on coarse particles, is because the downcomer is only submerged 900 mils into the cell. So a coarse particle that's become attached here just has to rise up to the froth layer. So it doesn't have a huge distance to travel, so it's, good chance, it's got a good chance of hanging on. It just needs a very quiescent environment to get there. So therefore we recover a lot of the air that's put into the cell is actually recovered to concentrate. Where it comes to fine particles, as I mentioned, the turbulence in that downcomer is so great that those particles have got no choice but to be given the opportunity to be connected with uh, a bubble and a particle connected. So there are no streamlines in the downcomer. There's no way those particles can, can bypass the bubble. They're getting slammed into it. So the chances are they're going to be recovered. So not only are they getting slammed into it, there's so many bubbles. So if you look at this, we call it a high void fraction. Look, these little blue ones are the air bubbles the black of the particles. So there's lots of air bubbles in there. So there's very little chance for the fines missing the opportunity to be recovered. So as I mentioned, the first cell uh, went in Mount Isa in the late 80s. Um, and since then, we've done a lot, of, uh, a lot of changes to the design, hopefully to improve the cell. Uh, mainly the design changes have been around treating higher flow rates, higher capacity improving the wash water system, making it easier for operators to maintain and clean it, uh, ensuring the stable operation by introducing a tailings recycle system. Um, and I also, you know, this is a mention of the Surrey lens, and, and this is more like the old style. Um, you can imagine that the wear on one of these would be significantly greater than something that has a very gradual entry into it like this. So, We've done a lot of work on improving the slurry lens and hence lowering the power. And as you know, in aftermarket, we don't sell that many spare parts, which is unfortunate, but it's showing the benefit of the cell and how, uh, how well it wears. So now differentiating between the two cell types, or we have what we call E model cells, and they're our smaller cells for between two and 10 downcomers. They're rectangular. And in the E cell, we have an integrated flotation tank, uh, tailings box, and feed box. So in this case, the feed is introduced here, the pump pumps it up to the downcomers, the concentrate's recovered, the tailings flows down and is either uh, transported up through the dart valve to the next stage of the process, or 
in the event there isn't enough feed, it is recycled into the feed box to ensure there's constant flow available at all times. So this maintains our constant flow rate. It's very small and uh, most of our low capacity models are E-cells. This is just a couple of photos. There's one at Telfer. You can see theirs is actually uh, elevated quite high. Uh, this is one we commissioned last year at Consanti in Zambia. This is a 10 down comer. Um, you can see the froth being washed on that one. And this is the Cobar cell when it was uh, put in a few years ago, nice and clean. And that's the Cobar cell now, not quite so clean. The bigger cells, so once you want more than, more than the 10 down comer, uh, we use what we call a B model. Uh, the bees are, are round cells, exactly the same principle, except in this case, the tailings is discharged from the cell. So we, we need to have another way of recycling the tailings, because <coughs> it can't be done within the cell. So we have an external tailings recycle system for the, for the bee cell. So this is a, a PNID, or a, a, to, to give you an indication of how we recycle the tailings. The, 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 tail, the level is controlled in the cell by a valve here that controls the froth level. The tailings is released into our urn box. The tailings then has the opportunity to go either back into the feed pump or onto the next stage of the process or to tailings. So this is our external recycle system. So it's not integral to the tank, but it's a method that we have for ensuring that they have constant feed because that is so critical in Jamison cells. So this is what we call our urn box. As I mentioned, the older designs were J cells and they were fed from the top and the newer ones are B cells and they're fed from the bottom. Um, these ones are actually, uh, actually, Jack, you might have to tell me where this is. I think it's uh, uh, Moraba. Moraba North. Yeah. So these are J cells, they're fed from the top, and I think these are the ones we upgraded. Uh, they were upgraded in 2012 to Mark 4. Yep, so we upgraded are, the down comers, but they're still fed. So these are Mark, the Mark 1, and Mark, I think Mark 1 uh, Jamison cells in the photo. Yep. And then if we, this is a Mark 4, much more recent, you can see there's quite a bit of a difference. And these ones are bottom fed, so obviously no slurry coming in the top of the down cover, it comes in underneath uh, to reduce the height of the building if necessary. So in this case, just to show you, you can see that the, the top half is, is the slurry, and at some point there's a, there's a partition, and the bottom half is for air. So the air is being drawn out of the bottom half of the distributor, the slurry out of the top half. And just another example, this one's at Cadia in uh, New South Wales. So when you look at the whole system for a B cell, this is a Consanchi in Zambia, you can see the cell itself is, is elevated. The tailings can then be recycled through the urn box, which is here. With the tailings going on for further processing, that's a tailings pump box, and then some is recycled into the feed pump box here. And the feed pump then pumps up into the Jamison cell. So that's what a tower looks like for an installed Jamison cell. This is our biggest model. So the naming convention, and these are our, our, our standard designs. Um, it's pretty simple. So the, for the rectangular cells, the, the two to 10 down comma, they're E cells, and the numbers represent the dimensions. So an E1714 is a 1.7 by 1.4 meter tank, slash two with two down comers. Okay. So it's a pretty simple system once you've once worked it out. Similarly for the, for the round cells, B, it's bottom fed. It's a four and a half meter diameter tank and it has 12 down comers. So there are our round cells. And obviously, as you add downcomers, you increase the volumetric capacity that you can treat. So essentially, the client will tell us how much volume they want to treat, and then we can work out how many downcomers we need to install. Of course, we have, have to have one that's different, and that's the Z cell. 
And the Z cell is a bit of a, a hybrid between the, the two other cells. The, the, the Jamison cell in the flotation area is round, but it still has an attached uh, tailings and feed box, which makes it more like an E. Uh, I'm not quite sure what the Z stands for, but uh, so it's a, it's a round for the single down comer with the two um, boxes attached. No, no one knows the answer to that. So it's just the Z. So there's some little Z cells uh, in manufacture, again showing that the flotation component is round, but the, the rest <coughs> is square. So I think I've, I've probably gone over why we need NERM. We absolutely need constant flow rate. Um, and just to again show that the tailings comes up into the cell, into the air box, uh, hits a plate to distribute it. That which we're going to recycle to the, to the pump box heads out. That which isn't used for recycle heads on to the next stage of the process. Very simple device, but it's very important because the processes have changes. You know, the tonnage changes, the head grades change, operators make changes, and stuff happens. So um, it's very important for us to be able to control the recycle so that um, we can control the volumetric flow rate to make sure that the flotation component is working well at all times. So it's just a close up of where the urn box sits. It just sits under the, under the cell itself. And uh, you can see the tailings coming out of the Jamison cell. It's just being distributed within the box. The box just fills up. Some of the tailings is recycled back to the Jamison cell and then eventually um, the extra tailings will overflow onto the next stage of the process. So uh, this is in, in normal operation, it just sits there and it's just a box with volume in it, with slurry. Very simple. Nothing comes out the top. Nothing comes out the top. Even though we're entering from the bottom, there isn't a fountain. <laughs> it's very easy to sample from and, and other things. So. Just to uh, the diffusers that sit submerged in the slurry to, to force the air bubbles to distribute across the tank. Now let's go on to froth washing. Why do we want to wash froth? Well, entrainment is what, what I would call accidental recovery. So as a bubble's rising, it creates this, um, this wake of water. So it's, it's got water attached around the bubble and sometimes that wake of water has fine particles trapped in it. So as the, the bubbles rise, they accidentally bring things that just happen to be there. So if you think of these bubbles, you're looking down from above, all these bubbles are rising and it's got all this water in between. Well, there's just particles that are, happen to be there. And they're probably too fine to, to fall out by gravity, uh, so they just carry on. We don't want them there. They're diluting our concentrate gray, and we don't want them. So flotation is very much dependent on particle size. Um, so I've divided it here. It depends on what site you're talking about. If you're talking about MacArthur River where they grind everything to seven microns, well, a 10 micron particle is a coarse particle to them. But in general, 150 microns and above is, is, is a coarse particle in most uh, copper flotation circuits, and less than 10 is, is fine. So you can see in a, in a time-based process, after 30 seconds, you recover most of the intermediate particles, you float up to two minutes, you start recovering more coarse and more fine, and after four minutes, you've got nearly complete recovery of the intermediate stuff, and you're still, still missing a bit of the, the two ends of the curve. They're the tricky ones to float. But what's happened as you've been floating that over time is you've actually been dragging up, in this case, quartz, which is a non-floatable. Um, so as you've, you've recovered the, the valuable, you've just been recovering more and more of this, this quartz that you don't actually want. And that's because over time, you're recovering more and more water. And all of that water has some quartz in it in this case. So you don't want that. So how can we stop getting that accidental recovery? So in a normal flotation cell or a normal flotation, it's just a fact of life. They just recover water and they put in multiple cleaning stages to, to, to make the accidental recovery go down. So you recover in the first stage, you float it again. Well, less of that stuff you floated the first time will be accidentally recovered the second time. 
then you float it again, and less will be recovered the third time. But in our case, we can do it in one step. Because what we do is instead of allowing that water that's being recovered out of the pulp to be recovered, we replace it. So we simply say, well, we don't want the water that's got particles in it. So we just simply replace it with water that's clean because we added it, we know it's clean. So the water that was trying to be recovered just stays in the pulp, goes on to the next stage. And the only water that comes over the lip is the water that we put there. So it's nice and clean. So that eliminates entrainment. So we've washed the froth, we've let the water that it wanted to recover return to the pulp, and all the water that's coming over the lip now is water that we've added. So these are some uh, um, photos courtesy of McGill University, just to try and illustrate that. So if you, if you don't do anything, your, your froth is going to be dirty. And that's just the water that it's recovering. If you add wash water to it, you just see that the froth starts cleaning and you'll see that the, the colour of it improves. And if you keep adding it, the colour just keeps improving. And that's just because you're adding clean water and you're washing out the dirty water. So um, this is just a, a short video showing the wash water being added through our wash water system and raining down on the concentrate as it's being recovered. It doesn't seem to be washing that much of it, but the reality is uh, we're pretty good at eliminating about 75% of the accidental recovery. So it's, it's a pretty good uh, job that it does. And as I said, compared to conventional cells, they don't have this. So this can make a significant difference in our concentrate grade. So once, sort of in summary, the, the advantages over the other technologies, the, the Jamison cell really just has the three zones. It has the downcome of a collection. It has the tank for separation, where the tailings flow by gravity out the bottom, and then the froth is recovered. And then we have the cleaning, or the froth washing. Um, so those three simple steps are not available in all machines. We have a different collection zone to regular tank cells. Although the separation is essentially the same, you're getting a, a separation between uh, the rising bubbles and the, and the falling um, tailings. But we have froth washing and they don't. We're much better able to get recovery over a wide particle size range because we're going to ensure that those fine particles are actually slammed into bubbles, so we've got some chance of recovery. And then the coarse particles, because it's fairly quiescent when it comes out of the the downcomer, it's less likely to fall off. So we recover both ends pretty well, the coarse and the fine. The small bubbles, the high intensity mixing, the amount of air we physically have in the downcomer, and uh, we're able to therefore achieve high concentrate grades in one stage. So we don't need multiple stages to, to get it. Um, and we have high cell activity over the game because we have this, this wash water. The other advantage is we've got no moving parts, so nothing to wear out. You don't need compressors or blowers because we're sucking air out of the atmosphere. The air is free. Um, very simple. Simple to operate, uh, simple to commission. Pretty much turn them on and tune a couple of parameters and, and that's it. Well, I don't tell everyone that because we <laughs> won't want us on site to commission them. Um, very short residence time, so you can respond really quickly to change in the flotation circuit. The operators can make very quick changes and have the circuit settle down uh, very quickly. Conventional flotation circuits can have residence times of up to an hour. So if you imagine you make a change at one end, sometimes it's going to take an hour before you see the whole change in the circuit. Hours, it's a matter of minutes. So you make the change, you see the change. Um, very stable operation and it's, it's very robust. I went back to Cobar recently and did surveys that were similar to some surveys that we've done a few years ago and essentially got the same response. It just shows that, that the cells are a few years older now, a little bit worn out, had no problems getting the same performance. So where do we use the Jamison cell? Um, our best place, uh, if I just stick to base metals right now, is the best place is in cleaner circuits. So it's improving the concentrate grade reducing the number of flotation machines that they use, um, reducing the auxiliary equipment they use. You imagine three stages of cleaning require pumps and pipes and floor space. Uh, one stage of cleaning is simply the Jamison cell footprint. 
So it's a much smaller footprint and that reduces obviously the, the, the capital costs to, uh, to achieve that amount of concentrate. And they're easy to operate and easy to maintain. What we recommend to our clients, this is what we call our preferred cleaner circuit design. So we recommend in their cleaner circuit that they put a Jamison cell right at the head of it and recover as much as you can straight to final concentrate. So if it's liberated and you can clean it up, put it in final con. So in Cobar, where they have this circuit, we recover over 90% of the copper in their cleaner feet straight to final con in that step. Now what's left is um, the stuff that's not quite as well liberated, the stuff that floats a bit slower. Um, so then we, we just do a simple separation. We say, we don't really care what cells you use here, but just float it to get a tailings. So you don't have to worry about concentrate grade in this step. All you're worrying about is floating down to a low tailings grade. And then once you've done that, take the concentrate, refloat it in a Jamison cell and make high grade again. So now you're only dealing with 10% of your copper in this circuit because you've recovered 90% of it. So this part of the circuit becomes a lot smaller. All right. This you can just recirculate, just take a little bit out at a time, make nice high con grade, and then you're operating this stage to get recovery. It's a very simple circuit. It's actually been operating in North Parks since the mid 90s. And uh, uh, more recently we've installed it at, uh, at Cobar, at Sanchi, at uh, a similar one at Mount Isa and it's been very successful. So before the change at Cobar, they had multiple stages of flotation, arranged a bit chaotically, and then this is what their circuit end up, ended up with afterwards. So many less flotation stages, much simpler, easy to operate, easy to maintain. As I mentioned, the cleaner scalper produces 90% recovery, and in this case at 30% concentrate grade, so very high, high grade and very high recovery. And then the remaining stuff in the, in the little jamo, um, you can walk, operate anywhere along this grade recovery curve. If you want high recovery, you might operate up here and get a lower concentrate grade. If you want high concentrate grade, you wander back there and operate at that point. So it's a very simple circuit to operate. You pull the first one hard, get as much of the liberated stuff out at high grade, and then the second cell, you just let the operators work out where they want to operate. Do they want high grade? Do they want high recovery? So I guess that was where I was going to summarise and, and come to a conclusion. It's a very mature technology. It's been in the market for, for 30 years now. We've got over 353 installations. Uh, about equally, nearly equally spaced now between the coal and base metals. But as, as you know, coal has been uh, a pretty tough industry for the last few years, so most of our sales in the last few years have been into base metals. Um, in the early years, we had a lot of Jamison cells in SXEW, separating uh, the organics, which is very hydrophobic. So you know, oil, oils and waters don't mix too well, so the Jamison cell is very effective at doing that separation. Um, we can scale up either from flotation tests or from our pilot rigs. Uh, so that's something clients, some clients like us to go to site and run a pilot plant and show them what the performance is going to be like. Others are happy to, to trust us and, and go ahead. But now we've developed a mechanism where we can just do a laboratory flotation test to size the Jamison cells, which is making it a lot easier. So given that I haven't run out of time and nobody's yawning, I'll just go through uh, uh, the Mount Isa copper con concentrated <coughs> case study. So Mount Isa copper concentrated was originally built in the early 70s. Uh, so it's a pretty old, old circuit. And then in the early 2000s, um, there was an upgrade uh, actually while I was there and um, we installed some brand new tank cells. So we installed some in the scavenging circuit and then a couple in the, the cleaner circuit, just to increase the capacity, because the, the concentrator was, was getting very old. We also, at that time, put in one dinky little, little Jamison um, to clean the pre-float con. We did put another one in for slag cleaning, but it was only used intermittently, because slag is a process they only use, uh, they only process occasionally. So then they ran with that till uh, 2015. 
And by that stage, these old cells, the cleaners, reef cleaners, and the roughers, um, were all now over 40 years old, closing in on, on 50. So the equipment needed to be replaced. So what they decided was, they said, well, if we can, if we can replace these, these, this part of the process, the cleaner circuit, then we can use these cleaner cells and take down one of these lines and maintain these. So what they did was they replaced the cleaner circuit and then they used these cells to do this duty, which enabled them to then maintain these cells. And then they did the same for the next line. So what they ended up with then is they put in some Jamison cells, and they ended up, all that equipment you saw got replaced by three Jamison cells. So all of that equipment. The two retreat banks, the two recleaner banks, the three cleaner banks, and three columns replaced with three Jamison cells. So you can see that's a huge reduction in footprint and simplicity. So what we know from that example is that we had a 62% reduction in the volume required for flotation. We had a 76% reduction in the surface area for flotation. And a 27% reduction in the lip length, the, the lip where the concentrates recovered over. So that can demonstrate that Jamison cells are way more efficient and you need a much smaller area with these cells to, to improve the performance. So in this case, the metallurgy improved the concentrate grade increased and the recovery increased. It actually wasn't part of the justification of the project. It was always asset integrity. Let's replace this old equipment and we want to maintain the same performance. It took them a while to learn the new circuit because it's so few pieces of equipment. You've got to learn how to operate it a little bit differently. But now they've uh, been able to demonstrate a significant and sustained improvement. And this is an example showing the performance before in 2014 when the, uh, with all that extra equipment and in 2016 with way less equipment but now we're operating with Jamison cells. So you can see in this case the coarse particle recovery is about the same but there's been a 10% improvement in those fine particles. So we puddled them into bubbles and we recovered them. And this is what it looks like. So three Jamison cells taking up that small footprint replaced essentially half a building. So it's been a very successful project and it has a, a very good payback. And these are those same cells uh, right. I think I'm gonna leave it there and uh, open the floor to any questions. Does everyone know what they need to know about Jamison cells now? Or do you have, is there something that, uh, something further you'd like to know? Virginia, it seems like the technology is a no-brainer in comparisons against other technologies. So what would be the one reason somebody doesn't adopt it and what's your response? <laughs> That's a great question. Great question. Um, I could say that it's been very frustrating all the years I spent in Canada and uh, trying to get people to adopt the Jamison cell. I think uh, people don't understand it. So they work with technologies that are essentially, you stir it up, you add air, you get a separation. And we don't have any of that. We don't stir it. We just, you know, we accelerate it through a jet and we pummel bubbles and particles together and it, it's very effective. Um, seeing is believing. What we've found is once people, once you can get them over the hurdle of putting in a Jamison cell, we have a lot of return clients. Oh, it works really well, let's put in another one. So, it, but being able to actually sell the first one, it's actually a challenge and uh, all we can do is continually to work, continually work away at, uh, at their doubts and their, their lack of understanding. Um, one of the advantages of, of uh, of our pilot testing is, it's fully scalable. So if they're interested but in doubt, 
then pilot testing is one of the answers. So this is our, our pilot uh, Genesis cell that goes to site. We'd take that to a mine site, we'd plumb it into their feed, and then we'd do test work. And then the beauty of this is the physics of this machine is the same as the physics of the big machine. So if it can do it in this, it can do it in the big one. And people understand that. We've got lots of case studies that said, look, here's the test work on site XYZ, and here's the results we got. So we know when you install it, they're the results you'll get. So that's, for, for a client who's, who's very challenging to, to convince, that really is the convincing. Do the piloting, sh demonstrate performance, and demonstrate that it's fully scalable. Um, no other questions? Well, thank you very much. Thank you.